In mid-August 1974, a passenger plane took off from New York's JFK airport and headed for Hawaii. Among the passengers was once the world's most famous pilot, Charles Lindbergh who was the first to fly solo from New York to Paris in 1927. His fame was once great, but now he is old, seriously ill, and dreams only of getting to the island of Maui, to the small bungalow he built for his family many years ago. The man who conquered the skies over the Atlantic, who was the idol of America and all of Europe, was flying to die. Since childhood, he had been interested in machinery, and so the family car and motorcycle were always in a half-built state. He entered the University of Wisconsin at the Faculty of Engineering Mechanics, but after two years he became interested in flying and became a cadet of the military flight school in Lincoln. Charles, however, could not finish his studies. There was no money. To earn money, began to travel around the country, was an aerial acrobat, performing on the wing of a flying airplane all sorts of tricks, worked as a mechanic, after saving a few hundred dollars, bought an old biplane and joined the Postal Aviation Service, which in those years was not easier than serving in the Army. Flying had to be day, night, in all kinds of weather. Lindbergh ran on the line Chicago, Street Louis, and for five years made more than 7,000 flights, flew 1825 hours. To a single flight across the Atlantic, he was prompted by the prize of $25,000 announced in the newspapers but preparation for such a case needed a lot of money. Lindbergh persuaded several businessmen in Street Louis to help him, and for them such sponsorship was in case of success of the young pilot excellent advertising. For the flight, Lindbergh chose a small single-engine airplane with an upper wing of the company Ryan Airlines. Together with the designer of the machine D. Hale, thought over how to remake it for a transatlantic flight. All the changes were to increase fuel reserves and reduce the weight of the structure. Lindbergh did not want to sit in the airplane between the engine and the fuel tank, so he decided to place all the fuel in the tank in front of the cabin and in the wing. He also made big changes in the design of the cabin, removing from it everything that could be done without on the way. Spartan conditions did not frighten Lindbergh, and the struggle for every gram of weight led to the fact that the plane was deprived of sextant, fuel gauge, and radio station. Charles refused even 500 grams of mail, for the delivery of which the collector philatelist offered him a thousand dollars, and as a stock of provisions took with him only four sandwiches. At the end of April 1927, the machine was ready. It was possible to proceed to testing, but Lindbergh was in a hurry, fearing that he may be outpaced. On May 10, he accepted the plane at the San Diego plant and flew it across America to New York. Charles named the plane an IP, which stood for New York, Paris, and the car was also given a second name, Spirit of Street Louis, in honor of its Street Louis sponsors. The morning of May 21, 1927 was rainy. Lindbergh was seen off by hundreds of spectators, including Fox cameramen. The airplane was towed to the longest runway at New York's airport. The Spirit of Street Louis will not leave me. These were the last words Charles spoke to the reporters crowded on the runway. After a long run, the airplane pulled hard off the ground. Lindbergh took a compass direction and soon reached Long Island Strait. Here, the airplane accompanying him with reporters shook its wings and laid down on a reverse course. Lindbergh was left alone with space and the elements. He gazed at the instrument readings, occasionally looking down. There, between Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, ice flows were passing, leaden waves rippled near the shore, on which several ships were rocking. Charles firmly knew that in blind flight only the instruments would tell him the truth, and it was blindly that he was to fly on. There were no landmarks over the ocean. Soon a light fog covered the sea, through it sometimes only the tops of icebergs could be seen. But the fog gradually dissipated, and in a couple of hours it almost disappeared. The plane was at an altitude of 3,000 meters. It was dark all around. No moon was visible, only storm clouds overhead. When the pilot broke through them, it was snowing wet. After a couple more hours, the moon appeared, followed by the first signs of the coming day. The temperature rose, although a huge cloud still hung over the pilot's head. When after a few hours, the sun finally shone with full force, Charles began to descend. 
A strong southwest wind was raising white crests of waves on the surface of the ocean. At 11.30 a.m. from the steamer, which was at a distance of 200 miles from the British Isles, Lindbergh's plane was spotted. It was immediately reported by radio. At about 1.30 p.m., Lindbergh spotted a fishing schooner below and decided to clarify his location. It may seem like fiction today, but that's how they flew back then. Lindbergh lowered himself, muted the engine, and tried to ask the skipper with shouts and gestures what direction Ireland was in. But he either didn't hear him or didn't understand him. About three o'clock in the afternoon, the observation station on Vallant Island reported the passage of the plane, and about eight o'clock in the evening, Spirit of Street Lewis was over Plymouth. Soon the lights of Paris also loomed. Lindbergh circled the Eiffel Tower. After a short circle, he discovered the location of Le Borgue Airport. He was surprised that the road to it was jammed with cars. Here was the last circle over the field, landing. Having safely covered a distance of 5,800 kilometers in 33 hours and 22 minutes, Lindbergh landed only half an hour later. The enthusiastic crowd carried him in their arms to a standing ovation. For Lindbergh, the triumphant meeting was a surprise because in the list of his priorities on arrival in Paris was scheduled to find a cheap hotel, and then suddenly the cheering crowd, which almost tore him and the plane for souvenirs. Lindbergh became an American national hero. The U.S. Congress awarded him the rank of Colonel of the Air Force, the press called American No. 1. And the U.S. President sent a warship to France for Charles. The day after landing, the pilot was received by the French President, who presented him with the Legion of Honor. On the same day, Lindbergh visited world flight pioneer Louis Blériot. The world raved about Charles's flight. In New York, the car in which he rode through a crowd of enthusiastic fans followed a truck in the back of which were 55,000 congratulatory telegrams. One of them was signed by 17,500 people and was 170 meters long. The name of Lindbergh named streets, squares, restaurants. The flight stirred the world community. The public admired Lindbergh's courage, and when he was asked why he risked flying on a single-engine airplane alone, Charles replied, All record flights are performed at the limit of the aircraft's capabilities, so he did not want to risk the life of another person. In 1935, Lindbergh and his family moved to Europe. At the invitation of the governments of France and Germany, he visited several aircraft factories. He was especially fascinated by the German aviation industry. Lindbergh did not hide his emotions, and to such an extent that in 1938 Heinrich Göring presented him to the Order of the German Eagle. In Berlin, Lindbergh attended the opening of the Olympic Games, stood next to Hitler, and his wife, Anna was admired by the Fuhrer so much that in a letter to his mother called him a great man and prophet. The couple were even going to live in Germany, but after the Jewish pogroms that began there, they abandoned the idea. The attitude to the pro-Nazi sentiments of Lindbergh in the United States did not find understanding, especially since upon his return to his homeland, he supported the actions of Nazi Germany and was against America's entry into World War II. Lindbergh criticized Roosevelt's policies and resigned. He repeatedly stated that he considered the USSR the greatest evil, called for the creation of a Western rampart against the Mongols, Persians, and Moors. Only after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Lindbergh's views changed. He began to rush to the front, but the most famous pilot of America was made clear. He is no longer believed. At his own risk, he went to the front in a uniform he bought at the store. No insignia. No insignia. Lindbergh flew about 50 combat missions, but this was just his private war. He was no longer an American hero. On the contrary, many people were prejudiced against him, considering him a national socialist. After the war, Lindbergh worked as a consultant at the U.S. Air Force headquarters, and in 1954 Dwight Eisenhower promoted him to the rank of Brigadier General. He worked with Pan American and advised that airline's management on the purchase of passenger jets. Lindbergh participated in the project to create the Boeing 747, traveled extensively, in the late 1960s actively conducted a company to protect whales, opposed supersonic transport planes, believing that it would affect the Earth's atmosphere. 
together with the French scientist A. Carroll, even developed methods of storing human organs, was one of those involved in the creation of an artificial heart. Charles Lindbergh, a man of desperate courage, a true embodiment of the American dream, a man who experienced in his century and triumph and suffering and delusion, died on the morning of August 26, 1974, in his bungalow on the island of Maya, to the sound of the surf, remembering his experiences. Friends, thank you for watching. Support the channel by subscribing, liking, or commenting. And see you in new exciting videos.